But a different sports spectacle brought the city new prominence in 1980, the NCAA Basketball Championship Finals. I'm Bill Fleming, and once again, I'm pleased to be your host as the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company presents Louisville at the Wire, the 42nd NCAA Basketball Championship. Market Square Arena was the battleground for the final four survivors of this year's expanded tournament, which included a record 48 teams. The enthusiastic followers of the Final Four thundered their support for Purdue, for UCLA, for Iowa, and for Louisville. Iowa and Louisville were paired in the first semifinal game, UCLA and Purdue in the second. The Hawkeyes were making their fifth tournament appearance, their second straight under coach Newt Olson. Iowa posted a 19-8 regular season record and finished fourth in the Big Ten. The Hawkeyes were an at-large selection to the tournament, and they used their great team cohesiveness to the fullest extent when All-America guard Ronnie Lester was forced to the sidelines with a knee injury after Iowa jumped off to an impressive 10-0 start just a third of the way through the season. The Hawks had gotten to the Final Four through the tough East Regional, posting impressive wins over Virginia Commonwealth, North Carolina State, and upsetting the number one seed Syracuse in the semifinals. The Hawkeyes still had not convinced some skeptics that they were for real until they battled back from a 14-point deficit to upset Georgetown 81-80 in the finals. That was convincing. Louisville was more successful than Coach Denny Crum ever could have expected. Heading into the semifinals, the Cardinals had lost only once in their last 25 games. During that tremendous stretch, they were led by this man, Darrell Griffin, the Sporting News Player of the Year, the recipient of the John Wooden Award, signifying the best college player in the country. Darrell and his talented teammates almost had their streak ended early in the Midwest Regional, surviving a 71-69 overtime thriller against Kansas State. Texas A&M gave Louisville more trouble in the regional semifinals, but the Cardinals eventually won that one in overtime, 66-55. In the regional finals against top-seeded LSU, Louisville won easily, 86 to 66. Griffith played only 18 minutes because of foul trouble, but still he was named the Midwest Regional's outstanding player. Louisville coach Denny Crum comments on the surprising Final Four in 1980. It shows the overall balance, and it's not necessarily uh, who's the best uh, during the year. I think when it comes down to more who's playing best at the end of the year uh, are the teams that are going to get in and so many teams get in with the 48 team field that uh, it just comes down to a question of who plays best. Iowa and Louisville supporters were sky high as both teams wasted little time from the opening tip off dazzling the sellout crowd of nearly 17,000. Iowa drew first blood on this nifty Kenny Arnold pass into Lester. It was the first basket in a blistering start. Lester scored Iowa's first 10 points while Griffith hit 16 of Louisville's first 18 points on graceful maneuvers like this one. Coming up, a 22-foot. Griffith felt right at home, reflecting on Louisville's Freedom Hall. The crowd noise at Freedom Hall was tremendous. It really, it really just uplifted the team, and I knew going to Indianapolis that it would be the same thing and even more. And it was just like a six-man present on the court this was a scoring duel that few will ever forget. First, it was Lester, Iowa's all-time leading scorer. And then, Griffith, Louisville's all-time scorer. Iowa's Steve Waite gets into the action with a three-point play, putting the Hawkeyes ahead, 15 to 14. And the Cardinals came right back. With just over eight minutes remaining in the half, they had built a 22 to 17 lead. Then disaster struck the Hawks. Lester, apparently unhampered by his questionable knee, was fouled. Down he crashed. It was a nightmare that Iowa fans had feared. Lester's down. down. Although it wasn't the same injury suffered during the season, Lester was forced to leave the game with a severe bruise on the same knee. He never returned. The gritty Iowa players refused to buckle because of the mishap. At 7.04, they closed the gap to 22-21. Then Louisville took advantage of Derek Smith's rebound. He gets it out to Griffith who shows that he does a lot more than just shoot. He feeds Roger Berkman underneath. He scores. Louisville is back up by three. Hawkeye center Steve Craftsison tries to bring Iowa within one. He misses the shot. Smith rebounds, fires it out to Eaves. 
McCray cuts underneath a picture play coming up and the Cardinals go back on top 32 to 27. Each team added two more points and the Cardinals led by five at halftime 34 to 29. During that first half Darrell Griffith had been nothing short of phenomenal. 18 points three assists two block shots and a steal. Coach Crum felt there was a unique chemistry which made the Cardinals click this season. They just were very close together on and off the floor and uh, I don't really know any reason for it other than the fact that they just really cared about each other. Well Iowa certainly didn't let up in the second half. Craftsison got the Hawkeyes going on an assist from Kevin Boyle completing a three point play and Louisville's lead is trimmed to 34 to 32. But proving his first half performance was just the beginning. Darrell Griffith shows why Crum refers to him as poetry in motion. Then Iowa's Arnold hit two key baskets and Louisville's lead is cut to 42 to 40. Arnold tests McRae and he is brutally rejected. Moments later McRae comes up with another great defensive play inside. Leading Berkman on a breakaway. And Louisville scores six unanswered points on top again 48 to 40. Iowa's coach Lou Olson called timeout. Don't try to force it high to low. It's either going to be there or it's not. You can't throw a lot past into the middle. Louisville sticks to its game. When you're hot, you're hot. And Dr. Duncan Stein was sizzling. Griffith puts the Cardinals ahead 55 to 45, just over 11 minutes to go. However, the Hawkeyes hit four straight free throws, and Arnold narrows Louisville's lead 55 to 51. Every time the Hawkeyes would get within striking distance, the Cardinals would pour on the coal. Griffith hits a couple of touch baskets, including a three-point play. Scoring help from McCray and free throws by Eves extends Louisville's lead to 66-55 with just over seven minutes to go. Those amazing Hawkeyes, game after game, they seem to thrive on second-half comebacks. Aggressive play by Bob Hansen. And then a driving slam dunk by Vince Brookins over Griffith ignites Iowa's confidence. Hansen hits again. The Hawkeyes trail by four, 67-63, less than four minutes to go and a big play coming up here for Louisville. Griffith leading Smith, who puts the Cardinals up by seven, 72-65, 147 to go, and then the clincher. Moments later, Branch and Griffith combine to Smith. With just over a minute left, the score is 74 to 67. Time runs out for the Hawkeyes. With seconds on the clock, Griffith leaves to a thunderous standing ovation. What a performance, 34 points, one below his career high, five rebounds, two block shots, and three steals. He would call it the most satisfying performance of his career. The final score, Louisville 80, Iowa 72. Meanwhile, Purdue and UCLA were anxious to get the second semifinal underway. The Watermakers were making their third NCAA tournament appearance and their first under coach Lee Rose, who took the University of North Carolina Charlotte to the Final Four in 77. The Bothers were led by their All-America center, Joe Barry Carroll, standing seven feet one inch. During the regular season, Purdue had an 18 and nine mark, finishing third in the Big Ten race. The Bothers received an at-large bid and a home court advantage for first and second round competition. That provided help in edging LaSalle and St. John's in advancing to the Mideast Regional at Lexington's Rupp Arena. Rose directed the Boilermakers to a 76-69 win over Big Ten rival Indiana. And then in the finals of that regional, Purdue won 68-60 over Duke. The Bruins of UCLA, who had won an unprecedented 10 NCAA basketball championships were a surprise at large selection after a disappointing Pac-10 fourth place finish under first year coach Larry Brown. He was the third Bruin coach in the past four years. After a slow start, Brown built a winning lineup led by seniors Kiki Vandeway and James Wilkes, which included a sophomore center and two freshman guards. The Bruins won nine of their last 12 games, finishing 17 and nine overall and an unfamiliar fourth in the Pac-10 after 13 consecutive titles. UCLA headed to the West region and surprised everybody, except themselves perhaps, advancing to the Final Four for the first time since 76. They eliminated Old Dominion, upset number one ranked DePaul, knocked off Ohio State, and then Clemson in the finals. So it was Purdue, led by Joe Barry Carroll in the middle, against a young UCLA team trying to renew a familiar tradition. 
Just like the first semifinal, neither team was able to take an early advantage. Purdue sophomore Keith Edmondson hits one. The Barters lead four to three. Kiki Vandeweghe breaks loose for UCLA. And moments later, Carroll maneuvers underneath. And he's able to score his first basket of the game. Vandeweghe answers that one on a perfect feed from Michael Sanders. The Bruins take an 11 to 8 lead, 13 minutes to go in the first half. Purdue forward Drake Morris hits Carroll inside, and Joe Barry keeps the Boilers within one. Moments later, that UCLA strategy of getting the ball to Vandeweghe clicks again, and the Bruins lead 13 to 10, 12 and a half minutes to go in the half. Vandeweghe's value couldn't be more evident than right here. On this missed shot, he's Johnny on the spot and tips it in. 17 to 12, the Bruins lead. Free throws by Morris. And then a fine follow-up by Joe Barry Carroll quickly brings the Boilermakers back to 17 to 16. Michael Sanders was a key factor in UCLA's advancement to the Final Four. This hustling follow-up shows why he was named the West Region's outstanding player. With UCLA on top, 21 to 18 at the four-minute mark, Purdue connects with its own brand of aerial acrobatics. Guard Brian Walker, alley-oops to Carroll. UCLA reserve freshman forward Cliff Pruitt scores, and Edmondson counters with a clever, underhanded flip. That keeps the game separated by just a point. Vandeweghe leads Day down the middle. The Bruins take a 25 to 22 lead. A pair of Day free throws put UCLA back up by five. But Carroll scores on a 10-footer on an assist from Steve Walker, Brian's brother. He narrows the margin to three. Vandeweghe apparently thought it was somebody else's turn to shoot. But when there's nobody to go to, he hits it himself, bullseye. The Bruins build an eight-point lead to go in at halftime, 33 to 25, and the key for them was Kiki. Vandeweghe had 16 points, including 12 of UCLA's first 19. Although Joe Barry Carroll was effective with 10 points and six rebounds, he was not the dominant force that he was expected to be, as the quick, aggressive Bruins defense disrupted Purdue's game plan. As the second half began, it was Edmondson who brought the Boilermakers right back. He hit a layup, and then a jumper, narrowing UCLA's lead to 33-29 in the first minute of the final period. Neither team got much going for the next several minutes until UCLA made its move on this beautiful reverse layup by Vandeweghe at the 14-minute mark. The Bruins had an edge now, 43-35. After trading baskets, the Bruins go back up by 10, 47-37, when Vandeweghe hits Foster on a backdoor play. Throws call timeout. The Boilermakers regroup. Rob, keep it out of the middle. Make him stay on the side. Keep it on the side. Get the charge now, Rob. Keep the ball. And it worked. First, Morris connects. Then Edmondson drives the baseline. Then Edmondson brings Purdue back to within four, 47 to 43. But over the next three minutes, Purdue is outscored eight to four, including a big stuffer coming up by Vandeweghe. What a move. The Bruins are on top, 55 to 47. But in basketball, things can change very quickly. The momentum suddenly turns to Purdue. Six consecutive foul shots, including the last four by Brian Walker, brings Purdue within one. 57 to 56 with 3.40 to go. Brown, obviously disturbed, calls timeout. But the Boilermakers were serious about their comeback. Carroll followed a pair of UCLA free throws by Sanders with this big bucket. With 1.51 to play, the Boilermakers have an opportunity to take the lead, but the ball goes off the rim. The rebound is grabbed by Sanders. He's fouled by Carroll. A costly mistake. Sanders calmly sinks both sides of the one and one, and the Bruins can taste victory. But Carroll refused to quit when he takes a short turnaround. Sanders gets a little too excited. He's called for goaltending here, and UCLA's margin is cut to one. 61 to 60, 131 to go. Following a Purdue timeout, Brian Walker fouls Holton. 
And with 53 seconds to go, the freshman hits both shots, putting UCLA on top, 63-60. Walker brings the ball up court, where Morris's jump shot is rebounded by Vandeweghe, and Walker fouls with 41 seconds. And then Vandeweghe hits both shots under pressure. UCLA 65, Purdue 60. Edmondson wasn't through yet. Scores a twisting jumper. Purdue calls timeout. 28 seconds to go. We must get set defensively each time. We can get the charge on them. They throw long at times. Be ready to step over if they come at you. Walker is forced to foul Vandeweghe again. And Kiki hits both shots. Brown and the Bruins realize a new era in UCLA basketball is being etched into NCAA history. Final score, UCLA 67, Purdue 62, with the Bruin fans going wild. An elated Brown congratulates Joe Barry Carroll. Vandeweghe led all scores with 24 points. Edmondson played a fine game for Purdue. He led them with 23. Joe Barry Carroll had 17. UCLA's 21 out of 25 free throws certainly was a key factor in that win. Yes, the Bruins were back. Fans started showing up early for the third place game between Big Ten rivals Iowa and Purdue. Let's go, let's the Hawkeyes go. obviously missed Lester. Carroll went to town scoring 35 points and grabbing 12 rebounds. A fine performance for the senior after a disappointing semifinal game. Third place winner, Purdue, 75 to 58 over Isle. And so the stage was set for the final race to the wire. The last chapter in one of the most exciting college basketball races in history. UCLA, the Cinderella story of 1980, going for its first national championship since the celebrated glory years, ending with John Wooden's 10th title in 1975. But could a bunch of youngsters led by the veteran Kiki Vandeweghe and a new coach really justify calling themselves number one? They had one final test. The high-flying Cardinals of Louisville, who had come so close in recent years but had never won at all. Daryl Griffin had his final shot for the national title that he promised when he first went to Louisville. He was the catalyst of this tight-knit young team. It was Brown versus Crum who speaks about the UCLA mystique. I think I was able to instill into our team that they were no better than we were and that I happened to know as much about them as anybody and, and uh, uh, being a graduate and alumnus of there, uh, I follow them very closely. So we didn't have the same problem with that that I think a lot of the other schools that had to face them on the road uh, into the final four had. Yes, the long race was nearing an end and it was a perfect matchup. The game tipped off with one of the youngest NCAA finals lineups in history. Seven sophomores and freshmen. Louisville immediately went to their famous running game. Griffith gets a fine pass to Wiley Brown. And the Cardinals are on the board first. Vandeweghe, who was so great in the semifinals, counters. Both teams were playing cautiously in the early moments. Then Daryl Griffith puts Louisville up 10 to 6 with nearly seven minutes gone on the clock. And Louisville's hustle defensively pays off moments later when Griffith steals Holton's pass. Speeding up court, he leads Eves. But UCLA's Cliff Pruitt destroys what seemed to be a sure two-point. Foster hustles for the ball, and the Bruins are off to the races. It's Vandeweghe who calmly finds the basket over a late arriving Griffin. After trading buckets, UCLA takes its first lead, 16 to 14, and it's Pruitt, who came up with a defensive gem moments ago, who comes up with a big bucket here. UCLA stretched the lead to four and almost to six, but it was Griffin who makes the big block on Vandeweghe's shot. And following that, a nice combination of passes by Louisville, with Smith winding up with the basketball and putting it through the hole. UCLA's lead cut to 20 to 18. UCLA turned the ball over on the following play, and Eves tries from the corner. A little bit too hard, but Wright makes a leaping tip in to tie the score with four minutes to go. UCLA calls timeout. 
rest of the half, I want the weak side guard to dive. The weak side guard to dive on the entry. That's going to ball. Brown's encouragement pays off. Miss Chuck. Fulton rebounding, feeding Foster. And he shows why he was one of the fastest players in the country, nicknamed the Rocket, putting the Bruins up 26-22. UCLA keeps a four-point edge, 28-24. Griffith watches the clock wind down. With six seconds to go in the half, he turns and fires. He's got it. 28 for UCLA, Louisville 26 at halftime. What a ball game. Actually, both teams shot rather poorly in the first half. UCLA had 33%, Louisville 35. Louisville apparently had difficulty getting untracked in the first half. I felt I had to do something, and uh, so I uh, uncharacteristically uh, did a little yelling and screaming at them. I told them I thought they were choking, uh, that it was a shame that uh, we played so well getting there, that uh, at least uh, if we got beat, let's get beat because the other team's better, not because uh, we just didn't play uh, loose and relaxed and up to our ability, that this team was uh, no better than we were, and all we had to do was go out there and be loose. Well, Crumb scolding apparently woke up the Cardinals as they battle back and tie the score 32 all on this Eve's layup with just over 16 minutes to go in the game. Louisville was rolling with three straight baskets. Smith finding Brown coming down the middle. The Cardinals regain the lead 34 32 for the first time since 10 minutes were gone in the first half. Louisville's momentum continues when Eve's hits Griffith for a beautiful reverse shot putting the Cardinals up by four. Just over 15 minutes to go in the game. At this point, the Bruins called timeout. The defense was starting to crack, and Coach Brown felt it important to shore it up. UCLA pulled it within two. Then an outstanding defensive play by Vandeweghe gets the ball loose to Foster. He drives the length of the court, and he ties it up at 38 with 12.34 to go. Tight defense and alert board play by both teams made the going so tight that neither could gain more than a one-point advantage until Vandeweghe scraped the board again, and it was the speedy Foster who put UCLA in front, 48 to 45, seven minutes to play. Brown shows the tenseness as he tries to become the only coach to win the national title in his first year. Griffith misses, Vandeweghe rebounds. Again, he hits Foster who lost this perfect feed to Sanders. And it's 50-45 UCLA. Griffith gets on track when Brown feeds him with an alley-oop pass. He's fouled by Holton and connects for the three-point play. That makes the score 50-48 to with five minutes and 57 seconds to go. Moments later, Vandeweghe makes the score 54-50. The Bruins had an opportunity to go up by six with four minutes to go and perhaps eliminate Louisville's chances. Vandeweghe steals the ball, drives down court for what appears to be an easy layup. But Eve's speed throws him off balance just enough, forcing Kiki to miss the shot. It proves to be the turning point in the game. Louisville capitalizes with three quick baskets. Go, roll. Eve's hits from the baseline. Then, Eves down the lane. Foster tries a long-range bomb for UCLA. It misfires. McRae hauls down one of his 11 rebounds, and the Cardinal Partisans go crazy. Griffith pulls up. Connects on his last points as a college player, putting Louisville ahead 56-54. UCLA calling timeout, 2.17 to go. Everybody on the board, defensively, no foul, no lazy pass. They'll be frank. The worst thing we'll do is let them foul us. We're not going to give that ball up. We're not going to play it. UCLA turned the ball over, and Louisville works the clock down to 52 seconds. Sanders is forced to foul Smith. And Derek. It's both free throws, giving Louisville a 58-54 advantage. Crum talks about that moment. When Derrick hit those two free throws and the realization 
uh, that, hey, uh, we're going to win this thing. Uh, when that hit me, uh, it was just an unbelievable uh, uh, feeling of relief. Uh, uh, I can't say I was overjoyed because I think the pressure was so great that, that uh, the feeling of relief that, hey, can you believe it? We are finally uh, going to win one of these things. Following another UCLA turnover, the Cardinals get the ball right back, but Berkman throws it out of bounds with 43 seconds to go, and UCLA has another chance. Vandaway fires it. No good. Berkman rebounds. The Bruins' cold spell has lasted over four minutes. It appears that Louisville has won its first national basketball championship. Griffith feeds to Brown, who feeds McCray, who tries a slam dunk, and he's fouled by Sanders. Louisville goes wild as UCLA calls timeout. Only 14 ticks are left on the clock, and Coach Brown had some thoughtful words for his players. Hey, look, I'm so proud of you guys. Just hold your heads up. Something funny could happen. Unfortunately for the Bruins, something funny didn't happen. The seconds ticked off, and then time ran out. It was all over. Final score, Louisville 59, UCLA 54. Louisville's 33-3 record becomes the second most wins by an NCAA champion. Both coaches displayed great admiration for one another. Darrell Griffith had led all scores with 23 points, and he had kept his promise of bringing home the NCAA title to his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. To be number one in the United States, not only in your state, but other people's states, is just something that you can't hardly describe. Griffith was named the tournament's outstanding player and was joined on the all-tournament team by McCray, UCLA's Vandeway and Foster, and Purdue's Carroll. What a moment to cut the net down and then where it all began last november with 261 division one teams and as it always is it's anybody's race but when it was all over in 1980 it was louisville at the wire